My name is John Bowman. My pronouns are he, him, and today I'm here to talk about AVIF. In late 2019, I accepted an offer from Mozilla to work on their Firefox media team. This team is responsible for all the audio and video playback in the Firefox browser. I didn't really have a background in either of those, but um, that's been typical for me in my career. In the 20 odd years I've been in software, I've worked in a wide variety of areas, from console video games to credit card processing, from operating systems to web development. But rarely have I come to a new position with significant experience in the particular field I'm working in. For me, it's been a great way to learn a lot of new things, and even though I didn't know what I would be working on, I was excited to come to an organization whose mission I strongly identify with. Mozilla's Firefox is one of only three browsers in active development today. And of those three, it's the only one from a nonprofit organization with no shareholders and which has a manifesto dedicated to making the web a better place for everybody rather than maximizing growth or profits. Just before I started, I learned I'd be working on AVIF, a new image format based on the AV1 video codec. At the time, it was fair to say that what I knew about image formats could be summarized in basically one slide. <laughs> Even though I'd worked in computer graphics and done a fair amount of digital photography, I still didn't really need to know more. It's possible to make a tool or to use a tool quite well without knowing how the tool itself works. However, if you want to make new and better tools, you really have to dig into the details. But why did we need a new image format in the first place? As image consumers, we want things to look good and load fast, but users don't get to choose what image formats gain acceptance. That depends on what image producers and distributors choose. And that depends on the application, what image creation tools support, and what they cost. But what exactly is an image format? Let's build one from the ground up. This talk is about raster images, that is, images made of pixels in a two-dimensional grid. If we ignore color, we only need one bit per pixel, zero for black, one for white. Here's what the data portion of a smiley face image might look like. Even if we render them as pixels, though, it doesn't make visual sense. So we need some more information. Let's add metadata to tell us the dimensions. With those two bytes indicating that the image is seven pixels wide and six pixels high, we can render it in a recognizable way. All image formats are is pixel data plus metadata that tells us how to interpret it. OK, but what about color? Well, just like our black and white example, each pixel gets a number that corresponds to a color. For more possible colors, we just need more bits per pixel. So here's one possible set of four bit per pixel colors. Most formats apply compression to the image data, so it needs to be decoded before reading the pixel values. Also, the mapping of pixel values to colors can be more complicated, but the principles are basically the same. The image data stored in the file is called the encoded or compressed image, and the rest of the file with the metadata is called the container. Interpreting the structure of the container is handled by the parser, and decompressing the image data is handled by the codec. In the case of AVIF, the container is MP4, and the codec is AV1. More about MP4 in a minute, but first. There have been many new image formats over the years, but by far the most popular remain PNG and JPEG, which are 25 and 29 years old respectively. Why? Well, small improvements in compression yield much greater returns for video than still images. If you're YouTube, switching to the newest video codec means a dramatic reduction in bandwidth costs that may outweigh the fees to license a codec or even develop a new one. Also, PNG and, PNG and JPEG use quite efficient codecs. While there have been advances in image compression technology, the improvements haven't been significant enough to displace technologies that are supported basically everywhere. Also, it's only now that display technology is getting good enough and cheap enough that those formats are insufficient to take advantage of the full range of colors and brightness consumers are gaining access to. But like most things, I think it mostly comes down to money. AVIF is based on the AV1 video codec. Released in 2019, this was the first product from the Alliance for Open Media, or AOM, a nonprofit industry consortium that collaboratively develops open, royalty-free technology. This is a departure from most of the work in this area from groups like MPEG and JPEG, 
whose business models are based on licensing fees. You may have noticed that in 2017, Apple changed the default image format on iOS from JPEG to Heek. In fact, Heek and AVIF are very similar at the container level. The main difference is that AVIF uses the royalty-free AV1 codec, while Apple has to pay licensing fees to MPEG for the codec used in Heek. As a result, Heek images aren't well supported outside the Apple ecosystem. AOM was created by tech companies like Apple, Cisco, Google, Microsoft, Mozilla, and Netflix to share research and bring new technologies to market while eliminating licensing fees or risks of patent infringement that have hampered the adoption of modern audio-video technologies. Okay. Now that we know why the time was right for AVIF, let me tell you about my experience of implementing it. The rest of this talk will be a chronological narrative. This covers about two years, so rather than code, I'll be focusing on my personal experiences, learning the necessary theory, and navigating the social dynamics of developing and implementing open standards. As the only Mozilla employee working on AVIF, most of my collaboration would occur with members of other organizations within AOM and outside organizations implementing tools to create AVIF images. Since AVIF is a new format, I started with the standard, but to understand it, you need to start with MP4. MP4 is a general purpose container format for media. It defines a flexible system based on nestable boxes, which we'll see an example of shortly. Formats which use the MP4 container define the boxes specific to their needs. This brings us to the high efficiency image format, or HEIF, which defines the boxes necessary for images. And the multi-image application format, or MIAF, which defines additional constraints to ensure interoperability. Both the AVIF and HEIC containers are based on these standards. Again, the main difference is that AVIF uses the AV1 codec, while HEIC uses a codec called HEVC. Now, let's see what our smiley example would look like in the AVIF container. This is a tool for inspecting MP4 containers. On the left, you see the nestable boxes, and the right shows the contents of the selected box. Each box begins with a four-letter type and a size to make it easy for parsers to navigate. We don't have time to get into all the details, but just like our simple example, this box tells us the image dimensions. The compressed image data is contained in the MDAT box at the end. But from the container's perspective, all it knows is the size. Interpreting its contents is the job of the codec. Now let's talk about the software. Firefox has supported the AV1 codec for video playback since 2019. So my work was parsing the AVIF container and integrating it into Firefox's image system. I started by following the template of WebP support, which was added in 2018 and is only about 600 lines of C++. It's so small because it relies on a library from Google for doing both parsing the WebP container and decoding the image to RGB pixel values. More on those later. There is a similar library called libavif from AOM, which Chrome uses, but Firefox would not. Instead, we extended the existing Firefox MP4 parser. Part of the reason being that libavif is written in C, and the Firefox MP4 parser is written in Rust, a language whose memory safety makes the broadest class of security bugs impossible. This is very valuable when reading untrusted input, such as random images from the internet. Also, Chrome has had WebP support since 2014, but in 2019, AVIF was a brand new standard, still undergoing active editing. It's important to have multiple implementations of standards to ensure interoperability. As of 2019, libavif was the only parser implementing the AVIF standard. So, adding a second was important for pursuing principle six of the Mozilla Manifesto. The effectiveness of the internet as a public resource depends upon interoperability, innovation, and decentralized participation worldwide. To sum up, WebP support was relatively simple because it relied on a Google library to do most of the work, which is good since the WebP format was well established at that time. But since AVIF was a new format, it was important to have multiple implementations. To add AVIF support to the Firefox MP4 parser, what was missing was the entirety of the Heath, MIAF, and AVIF standards. The existing MP4 parser was a great starting point, but there was still quite a bit to implement. For my prototype, I only added support for these five boxes necessary to extract the image data. After that, 
pass the image data from Rust to C++ so the AV1 decoder could decompress it, and then pass the pixel values to the graphics system to render. However, getting pixel data didn't mean it was the kind that could be rendered by the graphics system. Now it's time to talk about RGB pixel values. There are many ways to represent colors numerically, but the one you're most likely to have seen before is RGB. In this model, red, green, and blue are the primary colors of light, and adding them together in different ratios can produce all the different colors in this circle. I knew there were other models for numerically describing colors, and we'll talk more about color models later, but starting out on this project, all that I knew was that an RGB pixel value looked like three numbers between 0 and 255. In the WebP example I was basing my implementation on, the third-party Google library returned RGB pixel values, which the Firefox graphics system understood. However, when I used the AV1 library to decode the image data, the pixel values I got were in a format I was unfamiliar with called YUV. Unlike RGB, which describes color in terms of how much red, green, and blue to add together, YUV separates color into luminance and chrominance. You can think of luminance as the brightness independent of color. Rendering it alone gives a black and white image like you can see. Chrominance is just the color information that needs to be added to the luminance to create the final image. The Y in YUV is the luminance channel, and the chrominance is separated into two channels. U is how much blue to add or subtract, and V is how much red to add or subtract. Human vision is more sensitive to changes in brightness than color, so YUV achieves better results than RGB by dedicating more bandwidth to luminance and less to chrominance. This isn't an AVIF innovation. WebP and even JPEG typically use YUV internally. However, the Google WebP library handles the conversion to RGB, while the AV1 decoders do not. The Firefox graphics system requires RGB input, so the last step from my prototype was converting from YUB to RGB. Fortunately, Firefox already included a third-party library for that called, wait for it, libyuv. <laughs> After figuring out how to use it, I could finally see an AVIF rendered in the browser. This was incredibly exciting, um, but there weren't that many AVIF images to test with. The reference implementation had support for converting PNGs and JPEGs to AVIF, but that wouldn't test any of the newer AVIF features that didn't exist in those older formats. Fortunately, AOM had a collection of test images for that. However, the problem when you're implementing a new format is, how do you know what it's supposed to look like? Some of my images I was pretty sure were right. Others, not so much. But at least some of my test images looked better than Windows at the time. So, in early March 2020, I posted an issue to AOM's bug tracker for the AVIF standard requesting expected outputs for the sample images. This is how I first met Joe Drago, a Netflix engineer who wrote and maintained libavif, the C-based reference implementation that I mentioned previously. Joe would eventually go on to teach me basically all I needed to know about color theory, which turned out to be a lot. Before starting at Mozilla, I had a basic understanding that ele electronic images were created by converting numbers of different intensities of red, green, and blue light. But how does that conversion work? As promised, let's talk about the RGB color model. But first, we need to talk about human vision. When we see color, it's the result of different wavelengths hit of light hitting our eyes. A rainbow occurs when light varies gradually across the wavelengths we're sensitive to. However, all the colors in the rainbow are not all the colors we perceive. Rainbows only contain what are called spectral colors, that is, colors that are made of a single wavelength. Rainbows notably lack magenta, because we perceive it when light from both ends of the spectrum, but not the middle, hits our eyes simultaneously. That is, red and blue, but no green. So why does this work? And how do we use just red, green, and blue to generate all of the other colors, including magenta? To understand that, we need to talk about the anatomy of human vision. Our perception of color is due to the cone cells in our retinas. We have three different kinds, each of which respond differently according to the wavelength of light hitting them. In this graph, they're, sent, they're referred to as short, medium, and long, according to the wavelengths they're most sensitive to. Our experience of color depends on how much all three types are stimulated at once. And as we've seen with magenta, that can require more than one wavelength simultaneously. So, even if we had a light source that could generate any single wavelength, it couldn't reproduce all the colors we can see. But 
we do have effectively fixed wavelength light sources, and we can mix them at various ratios to stimulate our cone cells and give us the perception of both spectral and non-spectral colors. This is a spectral distribution of a spinach leaf illuminated by sunlight. At any given time, on any part of our retina, there's not just one wavelength of light, but a whole distribution with various intensities. Plotted with our cone cell's sensitivity response, you can see that spinach light, or spinach, mostly reflects light outside our eye's visual range. And inside that range, it mostly reflects light centered around our medium cone. So, despite being a complex distribution of wavelengths, we just see green. For every color we see, there are many wavelength distributions which similarly stimulate the three cone types. Consider these two cases that we see as yellow. On top, we have a single wavelength. On the bottom, a distribution of red, green, and blue lights made up of various intensities across the spectrum. However, in both cases, multiplying these distributions by the cone's spectral sensitivity gives the same response. Minimal stimulation of the short cones and significant stimulation of both medium and long cones, resulting in the same sensation of yellow. Our displays can't generate arbitrary wavelength distributions. They simulate this effect by mixing our three primary fixed wavelengths in different ratios. But what wavelengths are the primaries? To answer that, we need to talk about color spaces. This is a chromaticity diagram. Given a fixed luminance, the filled-in portion represents all human visible colors. All the spectral colors are on the outer curved boundary, with the wavelengths labeled. Points inside the boundary are the non-spectral colors, requiring multiple wavelengths. Any points outside are imaginary, because they require negative light to produce. With additive color mixing, which is what you get when combining light as opposed to pigment, any combination of two real colors is also a real color, and that resultant color will fall along a line between its components. Notice that magenta falls right in the middle of a line between the bluest and the reddest wavelengths. This has two important consequences. First, with any set of three real colors as primaries, mixing them can generate any of the colors inside the triangle they form. Here's an example. Second, since the region of real colors is not a triangle, no set of three primaries can reproduce all real colors. But plotting the primaries on this diagram shows us what colors can be, repro re be reproduced. Therefore, the primaries define the color space, and the set of colors that can be represented in that space are called its gamut. Theoretically, making the triangle as large as possible maximizes the number of colors in the gamut. But in practice, we're constrained by the physical limitations of our displays. The color space in this diagram is called sRGB, and it was created in 1996 to use on monitors, printers, and the web. These primaries were chosen because they're similar to what displays at the time used. It's still the default, so images that don't indicate a color space in their metadata are assumed to use sRGB. To interpret an RGB pixel value, you need to know what color space it's in. Standard spaces like sRGB exist to describe images in a device-independent way. But displays have their own spaces, their own color spaces, determined by the colors of the red, green, and blue subpixels. Here's how sRGB compares to the color space of my laptop display. To accurately reproduce colors on the display, we convert the RGB values based on the determined color space of the image to the color space of the display. And that tells us how to illuminate the display pixels. The display can only reproduce colors in its gamut, but since the sRGB gamut is completely contained by the display gamut, any color from an image encoded with sRGB can be reproduced. But it also means that images encoded with sRGB can't take full advantage of the display's capabilities. That's why, as displays get better, we need larger color spaces and more bits to describe them. Forward-looking support for these kinds of advances is part of what motivates the adoption of new formats like AVIF. Back to my example that looked wrong. I hadn't yet written code to extract the color space information and feed that into Firefox's mechanism for communicating it to the display. That's why things looked OK when the default sRGB space was being used, but wrong when it was a different one. Actually, there were other things wrong too, but we'll come back to that when we talk about transfer functions. At this point, I knew there were certain inputs that rendered incorrectly and features that were unsupported, but I was able to get something on the screen that looked right for the most common case replacing an sRGB JPEG with a smaller AVIF that looked just as good. 
I wanted to make this available to users because the more people you can get using your code and providing feedback early, the better it'll be by the time it's widely released. In May 2020, we shipped experimental AVIF support. The code was in the browser, but users had to opt in to use it since there were still missing features that would cause images to render incorrectly. Now we started to get bug reports, both from users and through automated fuzz testing. This is a process where the implementation is continuously fed randomized input to search for vulnerabilities. The choice for Rust, the choice of Rust for parsing the container was paying off, as this testing uncovered many opportunities for optimization, but no security issues. In late August, a developer named Cornell reported an issue with the Firefox MP4 parser. He said that the parser was rejecting inputs missing the metadata that marked them as MIAF compliant, and that Chrome, which uses the libAVIF parser, accepted them. He believed this metadata was optional and offered a code change to remove the check. The author of the AVIF standard commented and confirmed that it was technically required. And when Cornell didn't respond further, I considered the matter settled. In retrospect, I, it might have helped to explain my strict approach. AVIF was a brand new standard, so I thought the best way to help avoid bugs in software that created AVIF files was to strictly implement the requirements of the standard. But I didn't say anything at that time, and the issue wouldn't come up again for several months. In January 2021, after many months of development, fuzz testing, and telemetry monitoring, I thought we were ready to ship AVIF enabled by default. There were features missing, but I thought it was functional for the JPEG replacement use case, which would be the most common by far. Also, as a brand new format, which Chrome had only shipped a few months prior, I expected adoption to be gradual. I committed the change to the nightly release. After a few weeks, it would move to beta, followed by wide release a month after that. While in beta, two weeks before the release, there was a new comment on a bug I had filed many months ago to implement proper color space support. I believed we could ship without it initially, because assuming the default color space, sRGB, would be sufficient for nearly all inputs. I looked at the comment, didn't see a big difference in the rendering, and chalked it up to an unusual input that we didn't support yet. The following week, I left on vacation. I wasn't even concerned <laughs> about AVIF shipping in my absence. I started that process over a month ago, and several weeks and nightly and beta had passed without any serious issues. So I was surprised to receive an urgent call from the release manager saying they wanted to pull AVIF support just a few days before the release. For a project the size of Firefox, making any change at all this late is a major hassle, since even trivial ones can have unintended consequences. Fortunately, the release manager was able to revert my change to enable AVIF by default one day before release, and the crisis was averted. When I returned, I learned the comment on the color space issue came from an engineer at Akamai, one of the world's largest content distribution networks, or CDNs. Unbeknownst to me, they were on the verge of deploying AVIF in a way which would automatically replace JPEGs with AVIFs for their customers' websites, meaning my expectations of gradual adoption were slightly misguided. <laughs> Though I had been regularly attending AOM meetings to discuss AVIF, none of the participating companies were CDNs, and I hadn't really anticipated this use case. It turned out the problem was with the conversion from YUV to RGB for certain color spaces. It was fixed with the help of a timely contribution, but now that I was aware that content distribution networks were using AVIF, I had other problems. Cornell, the developer who previously objected to the MP4 parser's strictness, started filing more issues about Firefox rejecting AVIF images as invalid when Chrome accepted them. I realized the images were being generated by Cornell's own AVIF writing tool which was being used by Cloudflare, another large CDN. There would be a lot of these files on the internet, and so we needed to find a solution. Cornell mentioned that he didn't have a copy of the MIAF standard, you know, the, the one that defines requirements for interoperability, because it wasn't free, and he objected on principle to the use of a commercial standard in an open format. At the time, I found this frustrating, but with perspective, I do think Cornell had some good points. However, adhering to the standard is important for interoperability, and treating Chrome's behavior as the de facto standard would make for a less interoperable AVIF ecosystem. I realized I can't really expect everyone to follow the standard, but if they follow Chrome, and I could get Chrome to follow the standard, that would be even better. In late March 2020, I shifted my focus to cataloging all the strictness discrepancies between Firefox and Chrome that I could find, and filing issues on both of them to bring it into alignment. 
I also added a new feature to Firefox's MP4 parser to configure its strictness at runtime. This allowed developers to use Firefox as a validation tool, as well as enabling a permissive mode that tries to render any input no matter how invalid. This led to faster diagnosis of issues when bugs were filed against Firefox for not accepting invalid AVIF inputs. I started to work very actively with three people. Joe, the maintainer of libAVIF, the, Chrome parser, the parser Chrome was using, his coworker Cyril, the, off, the editor of the AVIF standard, and Wante, the Chrome engineer implementing AVIF support. I started a chat room for us to discuss AVIF issues. And by early June 2021, there were no longer any meaningful discrepancies between the two. In the end, I disagreed with Cornell's approach, but I was actually grateful that it resulted in a better, more consistent implementations. Now, I shifted my attention to the two major features I wanted to finish before shipping AVIF, image transformations and proper color space support. Many formats support transforming the decoded image before display. This allows common editing operations to be performed by inserting a few bytes of metadata rather than re-encoding the image. The Heath standard defines three of these transforms, so they needed to be implemented for AVIF, rotation, mirroring, and cropping. Conceptually, this is pretty straightforward, as long as the order of operations is specified, which is the important kind of thing that MIAF does. However, as is often the case with technical specifications, the tendency to be precise and terse can sometimes result in language that's difficult for humans to consistently interpret. Rotation is straightforward. Values from zero to three are mapped to multiples of 90 degrees counterclockwise. Mirroring is conceptually even simpler since it only has two possibilities, horizontal and vertical. The text says, the axis specifies a vertical or horizontal axis for the mirroring operation. But what an axis means in a mirroring context is kind of ambiguous. Without it, vertical mirroring implies that the exchanged pixels move vertically. The top half becomes the bottom half and vice versa. But the inclusion of the term axis actually confuses things. In mathematics, rotation about an axis leaves points on the axis unchanged. Imagine a mirror held horizontally below this text. This is how I interpreted mirroring with a horizontal axis. And at the time, libAVIF did the same. However, Apple's implementation in Heek, which also uses the Heath standard, was the opposite. In April 2021, the text of the standard was updated. Mode specifies how the mirroring operation is performed. Zero indicates that the top and bottom parts of the image are exchanged, and one specifies that the left and the right parts are exchanged. Though much clearer, this change occurred in a draft amendment during 2021 that wasn't available even for purchase to people outside of the Heath committee. I had the benefit of being able to communicate directly with one of the committee members, and I still got this wrong initially. The difficulty of making a standard open and equitable while the standards body is for-profit and opaque remains a major challenge. I was definitely appreciating Cornell's perspective more. However, mirroring and rotation pale in comparison to the confusion around the cropping transform. Cropping is simply the act of taking an image and creating a new image by drawing a rectangle around a region and discarding the portions outside that rectangle. For historical reasons, this transform has the somewhat unusual name of clean aperture, commonly abbreviated to the name of its MP4 box, CLAP. The rotation and mirroring transforms were written at the time of the Heath standard and were intended to be applied to images. The CLAP transform was much older and intended for compositing video, which resulted in some unusual semantics. Pixel locations and images are typically described in terms of offset from the origin 00. zero. So, a cropping rectangle would normally be described by four integers, the two coordinates of the corner closest to the origin, plus the rectangle's width and height. The clap transform, however, describes the rectangle in terms of its offset from the center of the image. It only makes sense to crop at pixel boundaries, but for images that are an odd number of pixels wide or tall, the center is in the middle of a pixel, requiring the transform to instead be specified by four fractions. This makes it very easy to get these numbers wrong and end up with an invalid transform, which is exactly what I discovered with all the example files in the AOM test suite, which used it. So after spending so much time thinking about it, I realized that in addition to being error prone, this transform was actually dangerous. Applying transforms doesn't change the encoded image data itself. The software applies the transform and displays the result. 
In rotation or mirroring, it's all the same imagery, just in a different orientation. The clap transform, however, displays an image which doesn't include all the image data that's in the file. This is unlikely to be clear to users, so the risk of unwittingly transmitting an image containing sensitive data, which they believe has been removed, is quite real. A developer could even create a tool which crops this way in good faith, since adding 32 bytes of metadata is far easier than creating a new image. Similar vulnerabilities have existed ever since GPS-enabled cameras started adding location metadata to photos. While this data can be useful, when shared unintentionally, it can reveal very detailed private information. In May, I presented a proposal to restrict the use of CLAP to the AOM working group. While nobody denied the risks, there was hesitancy to remove a potentially necessary feature. One major concern was that the AV1 codex minimum image size is 16 by 16 pixels. While this is a reasonable for video, it's really not for still images. Heek has similar restrictions, which it addresses through the application of the CLAP transform. Thus began the long process of engaging different stakeholders within AOM to understand how we could mitigate this risk. In the meantime, we agreed that neither Firefox nor Chrome would implement CLAP support for the time being. Additionally, in early June, an informative note was added to the AVIF specification warning about the danger and that restrictions on this transformation's use may be forthcoming. Since this vulnerability had existed since the Heath standard was published in 2017, I was gratified to have been the first person to recognize the problem and to do something about it. This also led to the addition of an entire section on privacy considerations in the standard, which is great, but I still wanted to see a specific fix for the CLAP transform. With so many people to convince, this process would be a gradual and ongoing one. In the meantime, I worked on the last bug I needed to finish before shipping AVIF, proper color space support. We discussed how color spaces are defined in terms of their primaries. The standard format for this is an ICC profile. Here's an example of the macOS tool for viewing them. Firefox already had support for reading ICC profiles and converting between color spaces, but because ICC profiles are quite large and most images are encoded in terms of a few standard color spaces, a less flexible but more efficient way was recently devised to communicate color management information. Coding independent code points, or CICP values, specify the data to properly reproduce color with just three bytes of metadata. Each byte is an index into a table of commonly used values for the three parameters necessary to interpret decoded YUV data, the color primaries, the matrix coefficients, and the transfer characteristics. We've already talked about color primaries, and matrix coefficients are inputs to the YUV conversion function. Both are constants and straightforward to implement. The tricky one was transfer characteristics. It's time to talk about the last big piece of color theory I had to learn. To understand this, first we need to return to human vision. Imagine a black and white monitor with all pixels set to black. Then one is turned to white. The increase in brightness is pretty dramatic. Add another white pixel, and it's still significant, but less so. Continue this way, and the difference between 99 white pixels and 100 is nearly imperceptible. Each additional white pixel increases the amount of light from the screen by the same amount. We just don't perceive it that way. When I talked about YUV, I mentioned that we're more sensitive to changes in brightness than changes in color. Similarly, we're more sensitive to changes in brightness in a dark context than in a light one. Now, consider this gradient from black to white. It appears that the brightness increases linearly, and the RGB values would tend to confirm that. But these values are not how much light the display is producing. If we increase the light output linearly, it would look like this. Notice the huge difference between the first and second step. The more bits we use per pixel, the more colors we can represent, but we want our colors to be as visually distinct as possible. So we allocate more values towards the darker end of the range and fewer towards the brighter end. This is what the transfer characteristics do. Translate between the values we use in electrical representations like files and the values we use in optical representations like displays. Since these are functions rather than constant values, implementing the CIC, CICP support for transfer characteristics required a good bit of math, but now that I had closed the last blocking issue, it was time to try and ship. In August 2021, as beta for Firefox 92 was about to start, AVIF once again boarded the release train for its four-week journey. Then, on Friday, September 3rd, with release just two business days away, we received a bug report that AVIF images on the Atlantic's website weren't loading. 
Once again, we had to pull AVIF at the last minute. It was quickly apparent what was wrong. The AVIF container has a box type for color information. It either contains an ICC profile or CICP values. According to the HEAF standard, at most one such box is allowed per image item, but the images that were failing to display had two, one with the CICP values and the other an ICC profile. After inquiring with my contacts involved in ISO standards, I learned that the next version of HEAF would allow this, but again, that information wasn't available to anyone outside the HEAF standard committee. <sighs> the fix was simple, and though it was frustrating to wait one more release to finally ship, Discussing this in the AOM group led to an agreement that the reference implementation, which was responsible for creating these files, should default to using only features and standards that have actually been, you know, published. <laughs> so, yeah, I think that was a good outcome. And finally, on October 5th, 2021, Firefox 93 shipped with AVIF support enabled by default. After nearly two years at Mozilla, with most of it focused on AVIF, it was really gratifying to finally ship. At the same time, I was basically the only Mozilla employee who had done work on the project. This is not to say I did this work alone. The code contributions and instruction on color theory I had were invaluable. In many ways, my teammates were my colleagues working on AVIF and its related standards at Netflix, Google, Apple, and elsewhere. Nonetheless, this was the most significant project in my career, and I felt a great deal of accomplishment having been primarily responsible for it. There was still one more thing I wanted to finish the clap privacy problem, which I had been making gradual progress on for the past five months. Since AVIF was no longer my primary focus, and most of this work could only happen during AOM meetings a few times a month, it took a full five more months to reach an agreement. But then, in early March 2022, we reached consensus. Basically, we agreed to allow clap, but only when the origin was at the top left of the image preserving the ability to use it to create images with dimensions smaller than 16 pixels, but making it unsuitable for the general purpose cropping, which caused the vulnerability. I was quite happy with this outcome. Most of all, because it's the most significant time in my career where I've used both my technical and ethical skills to recognize a problem that had been there for a long time, but had the potential to become much more serious due to its inclusion in AVIF. I'm fairly certain that had I not maintained this effort over the 10 months required to reach an agreement, this change just wouldn't have happened. We spend so much of our time as software engineers adding functionality, but the thing that I'm most proud of is recognizing the potential for harm and doing the long, hard, non-technical work to make things safer. Well, that is my story, and I couldn't have done it without the help of all these folks. I hope this talk was interesting to you. AVIF was over two years of my life, and in 40 minutes, so obviously I've had to leave a lot out, and probably I got some things wrong. Um, I guess I've got like two minutes for Q&A, but um, if you have questions or comments, I'm quite interested to hear them, so feel free to find me in person afterwards or contact me electronically, but yeah, I guess two minutes. Uh, so the question is, who's using this format? Like, is it camera manufacturers? I talked about Akamai. Um, it's a pretty broad consortium. Um, the, the reason that like, Akamai is using it is because at this point, we've actually got a really significant reduction in file size. Like, AVIF, which uses the AV1 codec, um, is about like 50% better than JPEG. Um, so, you know, at, at the scale for them, it makes sense, but camera manufacturers are also interested in that sort of thing, more because of the advanced color space support. Um, but to be honest, uh, AVIF is kind of like a, a kitchen sink of features, which is, you know, what you get when you design by committee, but it's very compelling to a lot of people, and that's really what it takes to displace, you know, a giant, like, JPEG. Uh, the question is, how does it encode HDR information? And the answer is um, by using the, the standard. Um, one of the things that CICP values uh, specify is the transfer function, which is actually sort of the, the key bit for um, HDR. We didn't get into talking about HDR, but that stands for high dynamic range, which means that you're able to have like a much larger range of brightness values. When, when you only have eight bits per pixel, you can't really waste a lot of your range on like the difference between like white of your background and white of like looking directly at the sun. But HDR um, typically requires either 
10 or 12 bits per pixel. And then if you have an advanced transfer function that really does a good job of modeling the um, behavior of human vision, you can actually get you know, these really bright spectral highlights and you know, dark enough pixels to render your know, Game of Thrones in the, same, uh, in the same 12 or 10 bits. The question is, will AVIF get picked up and put on phones? And the answer is, it is already on phones. And it will even be in iOS and macOS in the next release, which is pretty exciting, because through all this, you know, Apple plays it very close to the vest. And despite chairing the, the AOM standard committee, like, would not say if they were actually going to put it on their, their software. All right, I think we got to stop there because I don't want to keep you from snack time. But thanks so much for coming out. <laughs>